Welcome back, everybody, to another Sabaton History Reaction video, keeping with my current theme of reacting to Sabaton History videos where I've already reacted to the music video itself. This is Red Baron, and this is the one we're going to dive into today. But before we get to that, I wanted to let you know that we do have a current poll going on over on Patreon, uh, and that's going to decide what video I will be reacting to tomorrow. So let's take a look at what the poll currently has available. All right, so this is the current vote we have going on over on Patreon. You can see the three choices are Checkmate Lincoln Knights, and I know they have a number of videos, so I haven't decided which one I will do first, but I'll do one of them if that wins. History of the Entire World, I guess, is one that uh, quite a few of you have been requesting, and then Oversimplified Hitler. Uh, so whichever one of these is winning when I get up in the morning on Tuesday morning to record my video, that's the one we're going to do tomorrow. So if you want to have a say in that and in future polls, just click on the link in the description to sign up on Patreon. That's uh, The polls are available to anybody at any patron level. And um, there's some other perks and things like that as well. But let's go ahead and dive into Sabaton History's Red Baron. I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Milwaukee from Sabaton, and this is Sabaton History. Now, we are standing in front of a bunker from the First World War because we're going to be talking about one of the songs from your album, The Great War. And today we're going to be talking about the Red Baron. Now, everybody knows who the Red Baron is. No. This is Fort Douaumont, the symbol of Verdun, and for many, the physical symbol of World War I. But perhaps the most enduring symbol of the war is the Red Baron. People might not know the Kaiser, the battles, or anything about the war in general, but they still recognize the name the Red Baron. Even over a hundred years after his death, he's still represented in books, movies, Snoopy, and songs. Manfred Albrecht Freiherr von Richthofen was born May the second, eighteen ninety-two, in Silesia to Prussian nobility. His father was an. So it's important to point out here that Silesia, at least the part of Silesia that he is, uh, he was born in, I believe, is now actually in the modern day Poland. Uh, so that was part of, you know, you got to remember that uh, the national borders as we know them today don't look like that a hundred years ago. In fact, many of the nations didn't exist. And even though Poland had a long history, Poland had kind of been reborn in the aftermath of World War I. So, and part of the territory that they now have is that part of Prussia uh, that the Red Baron was born in officer of the Imperial German Army, and Manfred enrolled into Volstadt Military School at age 11. He would rise to the rank of lieutenant in the 1st Uhlans, a prestigious cavalry regiment. However, when the war came, it became clear that cavalry would not play a major role on battlefields dominated by entrenched machine guns. To escape the monotony of guard duty in the trenches, von Richthofen looked to the skies, where the first reconnaissance planes flew, and he successfully applied for the air service in June 1915. He began his work as an observer in a two-seater on the Eastern Front. So I want to pause right there because it's interesting to note that um even though cavalry still existed by the time World War II starts, like he said, a lot of people understood that cavalry was kind of on its way out, being replaced by mechanized and mobilized uh, warfare. And Richthofen was one of those who makes the transition from cavalry to another service. Another person who did that in the First World War was George S. Patton, who basically becomes the very first tank brigade commander in uh, the United States military history. And he went from the cavalry as well. In fact, Patton, and we're going to do a video where I talk about him because I'm going through a biography on him right now. Patton actually led the first ever mechan or, um, motorized attack in military U.S. military history when he used a car uh, as part of the whole fight that was going on in Mexico before World War I over Pancho Villa. Uh, but that's for another discussion. Photographing Russian troops and was then transferred to Belgium. Now, airplanes were still a new thing, and they evolved rapidly during the war. By late 1915, the days of unarmed reconnaissance planes were over, and the single-seater fighter appeared over the battlefields, as did the first German flying aces, an ace being someone with five confirmed aerial kills. By early 1916, men like Max Immelmann and Oswald Belke made names for themselves as the Knights in the Skies, the first airmen to be awarded the Pour le Merite, Germany's highest military honor. They were huge stars. The public loved them and the enemy feared them. And of course, their image had a strong impact on young men like von Richthofen, who wanted to be just like them. Hmm.
This was the period of the Fokker Scourge, since thanks to Anthony Fokker's synchronization gear, German pilots were able to fire through their propellers and aim the gun by aiming the plane. And this so, you can't overstate what a huge deal that was, uh, and, and just the technology involved here that you could you could time you know as fast as those propellers are going, that you could time it so that you could shoot through the propeller without that hitting. I, I can imagine the first pilot who tested this out must have been really nervous. He was going to knock out his own propeller. Uh, but that was such a huge deal because it gave them so much of an advantage on the battlefield. Technology, especially with new technology like the airplane, every little update in technology could give you a huge advantage on the battlefield. This changed how aerial warfare was conducted. Fighting in the sky reached a new level of intensity. By mid-1916, the Allies had caught up in the aerial arms race, and over the skies of Verdun and the Somme, vicious dogfights took place. Oswald Belke and German Chief of Field Aviation Major Hermann von der Leith Thompson had a new idea to maximize the effectiveness of the German Air Force, the Jagdstaffel, called Jasta for short. This combined several planes into a unit that fought together and attacked the enemy in concert. So along with technology, the other thing you have going on is doctrine updates. Uh, so the race for supremacy in the air was going to come down to those two things. The, the ability to have better technology than your enemy, to be able to fire better than them, to be able to fly faster and turn quicker and get the drop on your enemy, but also the ability to learn how to operate. Uh, as a flying force. These things go hand in hand, and they were constantly changing as new technology and new doctrines were coming about. Belke would personally lead and train Yasta too, and he handpicked his pupils. One of them was Manfred von Richthofen, though it is unclear what Belke saw in von Richthofen, who had an unremarkable flying career so far, and who had actually crashed the first time he had flown in a fighter plane. Yasta II, or Yasta Belki as it became known, fought in northern France near the Somme. The pilots could usually choose their own planes, at the time either Fokker D3 or Albatross D1 or the new D2. On September 17th, the Yasta was operational and Richthofen got his first official aerial victory. Belki had eight principles to guide his pilots. Dicta Belki, which you can read in the description. And he had a huge impact on German air strategy. But he met his fate October 28th. Nearly a month after that, Richthofen's legend began. So let's stop right there because I want to go ahead and actually take a look at uh, what he had to say about those things. All right, so I'm not wearing my contacts today, so I've got to put my glasses on so I can actually read the screen. But here's what it, uh, Dicta Belke uh, says, Try to secure advantages before attacking. If possible, keep the sun behind you. And that was a big deal because flying with the sun behind you meant that your enemy couldn't see very well. Uh, and that gave you a big uh, visual advantage. Uh, always carry through an attack when you have started it. You know, because I think what he's trying to instill in them there is confidence. Okay, you've committed. Now stay committed. Don't, you know, start second guessing yourself and pull back. Uh, fire only at close range and only when your opponent is properly in your sights. Don't waste ammunition. Uh, always keep your eye on your opponent and never let yourself be deceived by ruses. If any form of attack, uh, in any form of attack, it is essential to assail your enemy from behind. Makes sense. If your opponent dives on you, do not try to evade his onslaught, but fly to meet it. That's kind of goes back to the idea of the cult of the offensive, which was uh, prevalent in World War I, and that was the idea that it was always better to go on the offensive than to defend. And even when you were defending, counterattacking was better than defending. When over the enemy's lines, never forget your own line of retreat, so have a plan of escape if necessary. Uh, and for the Staffel, the squadron, attack on principle in groups of four to six. When the fight breaks out, breaks up into a series of single combats take care that several do not go after the same opponent great stuff and again you know, remember we take this for granted now 100 years later but they were developing this stuff from nothing all right let's continue when he shot down british ace major leno hawker richthofen had embraced belke's teachings and raked in victory after victory diving whirling accelerating it all came naturally to him on january 12 1917 Following his 17th victory, von Richthofen was awarded the Pour le Marie, you can see him wearing given it there. command of his own Yasta, Yasta 11. He brought in Dicta Belki, 
and would lead the Yasta through personal example. Nowadays, Richthofen is often portrayed as the single hunter of the skies who flew mostly on his own in his bright red Fokker triplane. But in reality, his true merit was as commander of his Yasta. He was as skillful an organizer, teacher, and leader as he was a killer in the skies. Under his command, new aces emerged like Kurt Wolf, Werner Voss, and Manfred's own younger brother, Lothar von Richthofen. As spring arrived, they were equipped with a new Albatross D3, and what was known as Bloody April mm. began. Over the skies of Alas, the Yasta went to work like predators stalking prey, fighting aggressively and systematically. It was truly a bloody April, as Yasta 11 alone scored 89 confirmed victories. Wow. Richthofen shot down 21 planes that month and had by now surpassed Bulky. And it's important to note the distinction between victories and kills. And, and I, I kind of made that mistake in reacting to the Red Baron video, uh, the music video, and, and I called them kills. Uh, it wasn't necessary to kill your opponent. In fact, uh, I don't think they necessarily wanted to do that in every situation. Uh, a victory was just if you drove that plane from the battle, put him on the ground. You know, if you if you damaged the plane and caused him to have to crash land, even if he survived, that was still a victory. Uh, so it's important to make that distinction. The German press was ecstatic, and von Richthofen's fame rose to unprecedented levels. The newly promoted Rittmeister got worldwide attention. He was the Red Baron, the Petit Rouge, the Rote Kampflieger, because of the bright red of his planes. In the skies, there is no need for camouflage, and in battle, it paid to be recognized. Richthofen himself said, I make sure that my squadron sees me wherever I am. Like their commander, the men of Yasta 11 painted their planes in bright colors and distinct patterns. They were all differently colored. One was yellow with a black tail, another mm. green and dark brown. One had blue stripes, another a, a checkered pattern on the tail. Standing in a row, they looked like brightly colored birds or butterflies. To friend and foe alike, the Yasta became known as Richthofen's traveling right. circus, as it was always sent to where the fighting was heaviest. And apparently that's where Monty Python got uh, the idea of Monty Python's Flying Circus was from this name. They wanted to be seen by their enemies as well as by their comrades and the men on the ground. For the enemy, it should strike fear in their hearts. The famous red plane emerging from the clouds was, was terrifying for a new allied pilot. Friendly fire also happened a lot, especially yep. in the bigger engagements and the bright colors distinguish the Yasta from their enemies. Also, the men on the ground who watched cheering from their trenches could make out who made a kill. See, a victory in the sky had always to be confirmed in the yep. German aviation service. If no one saw you do it, then it didn't count towards the tally. And since there was natural competition between the young men, this was pretty important. Richthofen was a caring mentor to his pups. And as the pilots returned after each mission, he would meet them with both praise and lessons on how they could hone their craft even further. He was beloved by many, but highly respected by all. Yep. However, the pilots under Richthofen's command were not invincible. The Allies had experienced veterans and aces of their own, and many German aces fell prey to Allied machines. And this idea of respect is interesting to talk about, and I'm sure that they'll get into that when they talk about Richthofen's death, because... Um, that was absolutely true. They were treated very, uh, w w very highly. They, a lot of respect. Um, I think, for example, of uh, of his situation, but I can think of some other examples where uh, you were shot down behind enemy lines, and the the bodies were treated with re with respect, given military burials, given honors. Um, there there was a level of chivalry, uh, especially among the Air Corps. As bloody April passed, the balance shifted once more towards the Allies, with their fighters like the SE-5 and the Bristol F-2B. To counter this and increase the effectiveness of the Jagdstaffel, they were combined to the even bigger Jagdgeschwader, hunting squadrons. The first squadron, consisting of Yasta 3, 4, 11, and 33, was placed under the command of the Red Baron. This was 50 to 60 planes that could quickly be transferred around the front. In Flanders, during the build-up for the Battle of Passchendaele in the summer of 1917, 
British artillery was giving the German infantry hell. It was directed by reconnaissance planes, accompanied by bombers and fighters who were strafing the Germans on every run. Jagdgeschwader 1 was sent for to try to gain local air superiority. On July 6th, von Richthofen led the mission and they encountered an enemy bomber squadron. As the Red Baron positioned himself behind a British bomber, something hit his plane, ricocheted off the frame and hit the Baron in the back of his head. Nearly unconscious and with blood pouring from the wound, he broke off the attack, but the hit temporarily blinded him. But he didn't panic and calmly turned off his engine. There was nothing he could do until the shock wore off and his sight returned. Uh. His plane had lost altitude by then, but two other pilots had guarded their commander from the enemy. Richtofen turned back on his engine and made his way back to the airfield. Who or what hit the Baron that day remains a mystery. Hmm. I never knew that. Richtofen did not return to his men until mid-August. His head still bandaged, but from hospital, he had contacted high command about new planes. The British, with their new Sopwiths, had the upper hand, while the German manufacturers hadn't produced something new in months. On his return to the squadron, Antony Fokker himself was there to greet the Red Baron with the new Fokker triplanes, the Fokker V4 prototypes. Fokker, of course, used the meeting as a PR coup, yeah. filming the Red Baron in the new triplane, which is another reason why the triplane became so associated with the Red Baron. But Richthofen only scored a fraction of his total kills in the triplane. The plane's reception was mixed, however. It was way more maneuverable than the biplane, sure, but not much of an improvement in terms of speed. Von Richthofen wasn't too happy about the prototype, especially now that the enemy's advantage in numbers was growing more than ever. As 1918 began, German high command wanted to see their star safe and sound, but the Red Baron could not be contained. And, and you know, here's an interesting point about that. When you get a person that gets the level of fame that Richthofen had, uh, you start as a high command to worry about the negative effect that that person dying would have. Uh, it's the reason, for example, that after John Glenn became famous as an astronaut, as the first American to orbit the Earth, that he never went into space again until he was an old man and a senator in his 70s. Uh, because there was that fear of what happens if something goes wrong. This is going to be a PR disaster for us. Because when you build somebody up to that level, it can all be taken away and have the opposite effect. The German spring offensives needed their best pilots to succeed. In April 1918, Baron von Richthofen pushed his machine to the limits, scoring 12 victories in just two weeks. It was bloody April all over again. But the fighting and the head wound took their toll. Richthofen became exhausted and isolated himself more and more from his peers and his men. On the 21st, one day after he scored his 80th victory, von Richthofen flew out once again. At 10.30, his men engaged the Australian Flying Corps over Kapi. Richthofen was seen chasing a camel scout. Uncharacteristically, against his own teachings, von Richthofen pursued the fleeing scout along the Somme Valley, deep into enemy territory. Canadian ace Captain Arthur Roy Brown spotted Richthofen and dove behind him, firing a burst at the Baron's tail. Richthofen went down in a beet field, and the red triplane came to a stop. But it wasn't red Brown that shot him down. Dead, killed by a single bullet through the heart. Captain Brown is officially credited for bringing down Richthofen's plane. He didn't. But it is more likely that the Baron was hit by fire from the ground as he was flying fairly low. But still to this day, there is a lot of controversy about the exact circumstances of his death. I believe, and I don't know if he'll talk about this, but I, I think I remember reading that they've actually figured out that that it had to have come from the ground, the angle and things like that. It, it was probably, a, I think, an Australian or New Zealander. I, I want to say it was one of the Anzac troops that actually shot him from the ground. The news reached the Yasta after they had already begun searching for him, and German High Command even sent out an official request to Allied High Command inquiring about the fate of the Red Baron. Manfred von Richthofen was buried by the Allies with full military honors, accompanied by an honor guard of officers from the Australian Flying Corps. His aircraft was taken apart for souvenirs, and even small pieces of the bright red canvas were valuable items. 
Some are hmm. still on display in museums in Britain, Look at that. Australia, and Canada. But despite the death of a hero, the legend of the Red Baron was and is still very much alive. And to this day, immortalized in songs like that by Sabaton. So, um, and I don't think they're going to mention this, but I believe my understanding is that the man who took over for the Red Baron in command of his unit was none other than Hermann Goering, uh, who would eventually you know, rise to be Hitler's right-hand man during World War II and in command of the Luftwaffe, who was a World War I flying hero himself. All right, so they talk a little bit here at the end about the, the song, but uh, not really a lot to add to the history that we're talking about. He does mention that they play a little bit of uh, Bach at the beginning, which I thought was really cool. Uh, but let's talk uh, in the comment section below about the Red Baron. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know what you would add to this. Um, your comments, your ideas, your questions, your uh, suggestions about all of this. Hit that like button if you would. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And we will see you again tomorrow with another reaction video. Thanks for watching.